why don't we start, you know, just with a little bit of a uh, of an introduction. Uh, the topic for today is is working with incarcerated populations, co-creating theater with them. Uh, I'll read the, the uh, description. The session gives gives uh, us guys uh, an opportunity to share collective experiences and also open it up for some of you guys that may have uh, some of the same experiences to share with the room. Uh, we'll explore and discuss the effects of the program has on the populations in prisons. Uh, it'll promote, a, we want to just have a collaborative learning experience here. So if anyone at any point wants to share out some of the stuff that they've done, that would be great. My name is Freedom Bradley Ballantyne. I'm from the Old Globe Theater. I'm the Director of Arts Engagement. And I'd like to just introduce this man. Can you tell us your name? Uh, yeah. Where are you from? Yeah, I'm Johnny Stallings. I live in Portland. Uh, I have a nonprofit organization called Open Hearts, Open Minds. We have programs in three prisons in Oregon. I've directed six uh, Shakespeare plays uh, at Two Rivers Correctional. And one of my star actors is to my left, <laughs> Alan Mills. Uh, he introduced me. I'm Alan Mills. <laughs> uh, and I've I think I performed in five of those plays um, for being transferred out. And uh, and here I sit on um, all of you. So. You played uh, Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream and Festy in Twelfth mm -hmm. Night. And uh, uh, in, in our first production, which was Hamlet, we had four Hamlets. He was one of our Hamlets, mm -hmm. and he also played Laertes. Mm -hmm. Mara? Morning, I'm Mara Sidmore. I'm with Actual Shakespeare Project in Boston, and I'm the Director of Education Programs, Projects, and Partnerships, and we work with the juvenile justice system in the state of Massachusetts, and we work all across the state, mostly on the east side, but all across the state with youth who are incarcerated. I'm Scott Jackson, I'm the Executive Director of Shakespeare at Notre Dame, and I've had a program going at Westville Correctional Center, which is Indiana's largest state prison, uh, for about four years now. Uh, and we're also the, the home of the Shakespeare Prisons Network, and with this guy here, uh, we, we staged the first two Shakespeare Prisons conferences in November 2013 and January 2016. Looking forward to the third, which we'll talk about. <laughs> I'm Kurt Toffin, I'm the founder of Shakespeare Behind Bars. I've been working in the correction system for 22 years. Uh, we have programs in Kentucky uh, and also programs in Michigan. Great. I, I'd like to take this time to ask a question out here to the, to the audience. Uh, how, have you all, uh, how have you all been working with uh, incarcerated populations? How did it become a priority? Uh, in your organization or practice, so if it isn't a priority within your organization and practice, what's preventing it from being a priority? Now, if you guys could just partner up, preferably if, you, if you're in the same organization, you can split up uh, and not talk to each other. Uh, just talk, to, can you discuss that among yourselves for a quick second? <laughs>
prisons, but it was part of my um, job interview process to say that I, I want to make it a priority in all my previous positions. I've worked with uh, juvenile uh, incarcerated um, youth. Uh, but I, I do playwriting programs, so I, I go in and I teach um, playwriting residencies and then bring in professional actors to uh, do readings for the, the prison population. Okay. What, about, what about in the back? Um, I'm an actor who uh, helped pilot a program with the Laura Shakespeare Festival last year. Okay. Yeah, so we were in yeah. touch with you guys, although yeah. Jamal yeah. was uh, our Pericles. Yes. And, um, and we really looked at the 10,000 things model, and David Stradley, our artistic director, was a, an amazing, generous, patient man, because I think leading up to the actual program, he did a year's worth of you know community engagement work personally with the different leaders in the Delaware area and with the different um, demographics that we were looking at and actually, you know, took a long time <laughs> to actually create the program um, and really invested in actors that really care about the mission. So, uh, so we're doing it again this year. So it was great, it was a great time for everyone and now I'm here to try to learn about how to build it even more. <laughs> All right, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, start it off. I guess I'm gonna start it off with you, Alan, okay. and just, uh, you know, just to talk a little bit about your experience with this program 
and and the programming of uh, of work. How and just if you could uh, tease out how it's affected you a little bit, you know how the programming, how you've been affected by it. Okay. Um, uh, well, I joined uh, Johnny's group in I think 2007 or 2008, and uh, before that, um, my career was on a very different trajectory. <laughs> um, and uh, I was actually at kind of a turning point where I was looking for something else. I was looking for something new. Uh, I, was, I was in kind of a rut of, of hanging out with bad people, people that weren't good for me, uh, and trying to impress them for the wrong reasons. Um, and, and I found Johnny's group, and that was, uh, that was interesting to me. It started out as a dialogue group. Um, and then it led into the, the plays and stuff. Um, but I found that throughout that, um, the, the stimulation of, of performing and rehearsing and stuff, it affected our other areas of my life. Um, I, I draw art, you know, uh, a visual artist. Um, I draw, drew a lot of portraits and wildlife scenes. <coughs> and, uh, and I noticed that when I was rehearsing and performing, that that creativity bled into my into other areas of my life, into, into the visual arts, um, and and I was I felt more inspired. Um, I think that uh, that the juvenile. I know there's a couple people mentioned the juvenile uh, stuff. Working with them, um, I was incarcerated as a juvenile as well, um, so I had you know <coughs> that had been going kind of a long. Uh, a poor path. Um, so I think outreach to the juvenile crowd is getting getting them before they go into you know big boy prison is is really important. Um, it, it, but I think you know uh, there's a certain level of, of maturity that people have to get to. For me, it, w it had to be a turning point. I had to find. I had to realize in my life that something wasn't right, and I had to look for something else. Um, and for most and for some people. Uh, for a lot of people, that's kind of what it is. It's like, well, I need to do something else with my life, and and this kind of um, this arts and prison thing kind of helped, um, kind of helped jumpstart that. Uh, so uh, from then on, I you know I, I stopped hanging out with this, the old you know the old crowd. Uh, I cut ties with all of them. Started hanging out with more the people that were in the uh, developed a camaraderie with the the people that were in our group. Um, <coughs> Uh, a, a type of uh, collaboration that doesn't exist anywhere else in the prison, um, and I think that really uh, is really beneficial for anybody, anybody incarcerated who's who's part of that program. So, um, I mean, uh, the results kind of speak for themselves when we look at the individuals who are um, graduating from those programs um, and then getting out and and being your next door neighbors, you know. Um, I think more prison outreach should be uh, should be done uh, by the states and stuff because that's what it comes down to is who do you want living next door to you? You know, the guy who's been in there on bread and water sleeping on a, a concrete pad or the guy who was showed a little bit of compassion and was allowed to develop some, uh, uh, some, uh, some empathy and uh, you know, relationships with other people in a positive way. So. <coughs> I'm, um, thanks. thanks uh, Johnny, um, I just want to, we had talked about what, what success, you know, looked like or how do you measure it and you push back on that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, just before we came up here this morning, <coughs> the phrase success came up and um, I know that when you're applying for grants, maybe some of you have any of you ever applied for a grant? <laughs> um, uh, one of the things they want to see is evidence-based, you know, they want you to prove mm -hmm. statistically that what you're doing is working. And uh, what I feel, uh, I guess I have to say that my, um, my philosophy of directing is very simple, love the heck and, and that has applications even outside of theater in prison. <coughs> and uh, like,
from the very beginning, before we even started doing theater, like if you get together in a room with people and something beautiful happens, so that we're all hoping for that this morning, um, that's success. Uh, you know, you can't, as you learn over time, you can't magically change everybody's whole life trajectory instantly by putting on a play. Um, but you can love somebody, and that's perfect. Goes deep, can't be erased, uh, and is very successful. Mark, can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing, uh, what's been done so far? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we partner with the Department of Youth Services. It's different, I think, the juvenile justice system work is very different from work with adult prisons, and I've noticed this at um, various conferences. It's the work tends to be uh, harder because the population is changing so quickly. So as an adult, when you're committed, you're typically given a sentence and you serve that sentence for a length of time in one location. For young people, they are, um, first of all, assessed. They're, so they, they go to um, a detaining center and then they go to an assessment center and then they go to um, their the place that they're gonna actually serve their sentence. And there are, things happening from day to literally day to day. So as teaching artists, we have to be extremely flexible and have no attachment to outcome whatsoever. Because we may start with a group of 10 young people in a facility, and the very next day, we might have two. And the very next day, we might have five. And we have to really attest our um, our, our skill to, to, to be really in the moment and able to see what they're really needs at any moment in any given time. I think that we're fortunate in terms of business model because this wasn't always the case, but we've been doing this work long enough for about a decade now. Um, but originally, we just literally knocked on a door and said, hey, we want to work inside, can we? And talk to um, staff and teachers who were in um, facilities teaching because young people go to school while they're in prison, of course. So. Um, that was sort of a like, can we come in? And people were generally like, sure, you know, and, and for most of the time. And so we, we um, began working inside without any restrictions. The lovely thing is that now the Department of Youth Services works with a subcontractor that's an education company called the Commonwealth Corporation in Massachusetts. And um, they actually have an arts program coordinator position that serves the state and partners with us and many other youth arts organizations to actually um, set up the residencies and then help us troubleshoot as we go along. So that's a really wonderful thing. At the same time, as you might imagine, because we're working in a system, in a system that involves a lot of uh, hierarchy and structure and things taking a very long time, there's a lot of red tape that we run into. And so our um, biggest challenge as well as blessing is that relationship with um, DYS and Comcore, the subcontractor, and maintaining that relationship all the time. And it's kind of like, in a way, they're part of our theater family in that sometimes we gotta duke it out with them, and sometimes we gotta um, be patient with one another, and they're, they're kind of part of our family. Um, in terms of what's happening inside, we actually have a, have a, we call it a mashup approach. So we use Shakespeare as a launching pad. We usually do pick a play. Um, we take the themes of that play and then we do a series of exercises depending on what the young people need. It could involve improv exercises around the themes of the play. It could involve writing, a lot of writing. We like them to generate text, so it's a co-created, devised piece together that we make around a particular, um, around a particular play of Shakespeare's. We're starting to dabble a little bit in other areas. So for instance, right now we have residency in a girls' facility where um, we're actually in a history classroom for the first time. And so uh, the teaching artist is doing a lot of work on uh, postmodern feminism and um, sort of historical uh, women's rights and taking that as a launching pad. And I don't know what she's going to weave in text-wise or not, but she'll create a theory <laughs> theory out of it. Have you thought about doing that? Uh, that sounds really interesting. Has, has, has that, have you thought about doing that with among men, male populations? Because so many women that are in, that are incarcerated have been victims of domestic violence. Have you thought about doing any kind of, you know, 
feminism class for the male juveniles? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a really great question. I don't know what their curriculum is um, currently. We're somewhat dependent on the, the teaching staff themselves um, and what the relationship <coughs> is there because they do dictate the curriculum as does in some ways the, the, the state. But I, I love that idea. I, I will say that, so we also have a unique program in that we're inside but we also recruit those young people so that when they are, and I think you hit on this a little bit, when they're released back into the community, we actually um, can pay them to come and take our programs and learn the skills of theater artists as a job. So we're hiring them to come and work for us. And they do our programs alongside um, all the other young people that we recruit from the city of Boston and, and, and the surrounds. And our goal there is to do what you're saying. So. Um, we, we do anti-oppression work with the young people. We actually train them in thinking through that lens. And when I say anti-oppression, that includes everything, right? So we're not just talking about anti-racism. We're not just talking about being aware of feminism. We're talking about any level of oppression and, and awakening them to understanding the systems of oppression that exist in our society so that we can have those conversations about what is it like. And many of our young people are, have been in very difficult situations and the, in being able to dialogue with each other. And one of our um, former incarcerated young people has said this very recently to us, you know, because I could talk to the uh, girls in the room who were in rehearsal together, um, I just, my mind was open to what they have been through and how I now can be as a young man to <coughs> support a change in culture. I want to go to Scott because we haven't heard from you. Uh, how do you get buy-in within your, you're at a big, you know, mm -hmm. super big organization. Uh, how do you get, how did you get buy-in within and how do you continue to get buy-in within an organization like Notre Dame? Sure, so, so in the beginning it was really <laughs> tough. I think that anyone who's aspiring at any level to, to, to do this work, there's a, there's a certain personal investment that, that is unexpected, I think, when you when you find just how consistent you have to be in this work. This isn't something where you can just fly in and, and fly back out. You've, you've got to commit for years, not months, not weeks, not days. <laughs> um, so once once you make that personal investment to yourself, and once you, you start at the ground foundational level to build a program up, you're gonna need you're gonna need partners, right? You're gonna need external partners. So being part of this this larger machine, as we were just saying, uh, with Notre Dame, uh, a lot of a lot of my work kind of gets lost in translation because it's not pertinent to research to someone's pet research <coughs> projects. However, Notre Dame, being Catholic University, is committed to social justice. And so when I when I bypass actually the provost lines and the faculty of Notre Dame and I go straight to the president's office and and find where the main mission is housed and actually served at the university, it's protected from the very top of, of the food chain at the university. And so all of the support filters down from um, that acknowledgement at the very top. Uh, and and then from that, you know, I make sure that I'm holding true. I'm not, and I'm not a Catholic, but but I, the dogma of, of Catholic social tradi tradition and teaching and serving the common good and starting with the least of us first. And these things all translate perfectly to, to the work that, that that I'm performing. And so from that, for four years now, what was kind of a, a oh, we're live streaming, aren't we? Uh, it's kind of a contentious pro uh, project with with certain people who are in authority. Um, for me, has become something that that those people are actually. It's their their case example, the the, the example of, of of Notre Dame's mission and action to the performing arts. So, seeing a, a total reversal of that. Um, it's a unique situation because I am part of a larger institution. Um, but I think that the lessons learned can be applied to, to any theater organization as well. Once, once folks are exposed to the work, once folks directly engage with the work, because like if you come to my program, um, and I think Kurt feels the same way, you're participating in the program. The observation is kind of not, that, that's not part of this gig. You have to come in with an authentic sense of self. And there's something that happens in that sharing that, that people walk away and they're going to be your advocates for life after they experience that. Well, Kurt, 
uh, what's getting results? What's working for you out there? Human beings need to try. Less mental illness is a part of the situation. You're the Unabomber living in the mountains of Montana. So you have factored in that. By and large, human beings need to try. So I play on that because I'm creating a tribe. Uh, human beings, in order to change, to transform, which I apply to all human beings, not just incarcerated human beings, and I apply it uniquely to myself because I'm not there to fix anybody. I'm there to fix me. I don't have any advice. <coughs> so the moment that someone presents a situation and someone says, well, I can solve that problem. No, you can't. You're going to give them advice. No advice here, please, because we're here to fix us. So reflection is essential. You have to understand where you came from. You have to understand all the circumstances around where you came from. You have to be able to really dig into that. And in particular cases with incarcerated population, there's so much trauma that's involved in that. But you cannot fix the trauma in yourself until you have language to speak to it. It's the only way it heals. You give it medication doesn't work. Just therapy doesn't work. You got to give them the capacity to go back and look at the horrors from whence they came. To be able to understand that they're simply a mirror of where they came. So they're totally innocent. They are just reflecting where they came from. Authentically. <clears throat> they're doing it authentically. So when transformation happens, when you realize there's something different, another possibility, another place to be, another human being to be, you have to go back and you have to reflect. <laughs> Theater naturally does that because the acting techniques are all there. You have to fill in all the blanks. Either you find yourself in the character, in the biography of the character. When you can't find yourself in the biogra biography, you use your dramatic imagination. That's how you get there, right? So using theater and, and, and acting is essential because when you help them with the tools to reflect upon the character that they're playing, you don't have to say anything about, well, why don't you use those tools on yourself? It just happens. It's a miracle. The last thing that you need is story. We are narrative creatures. It goes back to the trauma until you can speak your language to your trauma in order to share your story. Healing can't happen. And the beautiful thing that happens in the circle is as I'm telling my story, only two things happen. One, I go, you too? Or I go, I don't have your experience. I'm a rural agrarian farm kid. I wasn't growing up in the city. I didn't have violence in my home. Your story breaks my heart. We have empathy. So that's applied in every aspect of working with the prisoners, attempting to work with the prison administration, attempting to work with funders, board members. It's, it's, it's the same technique. I don't apply any different technique when I'm directing professionally. In fact, the work that I've done in prisons has informed me as an artist. It has informed me as a director, as an actor. It has informed me, most importantly, as a human being. So it's about that authenticity. And being authentic with whoever you're with, that's what moves me. I'm no different now with you than I am in any other situation in my life, with my family. I'm no different. I'm here. My heart is open. I'm not judging. I'm just here to try to make me better. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to take, you know, go on out here. Does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists that they've heard of anything that they said or any questions in general that they that we'd like to go ahead? Um, thank you all so much for being here this morning. <coughs> I've got some personal experience volunteering in the Dallas County Jail in a program called Resolana. 
and we work with women who are incarcerated there. Um, and we offer programs that are everything from acting and theater to visual art to a you know, variety of things, poetry, making art. Um, and one of our one of our success stories had to do with working with the administration. And there's a really big difference between working in a county jail and working in a state prison, <laughs> right? And there's a really big difference in having someone who is an officer who's in charge of the particular pod where you're working who understands. So I'd like to hear some of your worst horror stories and your best success stories in terms of the logistics of working with the people that you're working with. And some advice about everything from, you know, when you're working in the county jail and people are being admitted and they're being uh, released at all hours of the day and night, and in, in our case, working with women, it, it, for, every, for anyone, I can imagine, it was difficult if they had a rough night in the pod because they didn't get any sleep and they're not able to kind of show up. <laughs> um, and so everything from that to having the judges appreciate and understand the work so that the judges can advocate for that work as part of a plan to um, accelerate someone's release or to help them get, get any kind of participate in reentry. So I would just love to hear some of those kind of practical you know, stories that you have um, about working with the administration, working with the logistics of, of this institution that is so backwards. Hey, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had good and bad, definitely. <coughs> um, I think that working with prison administrations about 55% of the gig, it, it feels like, because it's so inconsistent, it feels like the classes and everything else, the offerings are, are the most consistent. Um, I remember in particular, so uh, one of the groups that's part of Shakespeare in Notre Dame is called Actors from the London Stage, and it's a five-person British troupe that, that generally tours to uh, universities all over the country. Yeah. Law University. Nice. Down yeah, right below you. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Um, and uh, so I, I've started a template where they, they premiere each show at my prison, at Westwood Correctional Center. and. I have buy-in at the very top with the warden, with the superintendent of the prison, but it comes down a lot of times to the shift captain. And so you'll be coming in and you're bringing a show in and uh, you're bringing units together, which rarely if ever happens, and then suddenly there's no count letter. What are you talking about? What count letter? You know, and then we're sitting there for two hours waiting for them to sort it out and then you end up getting to do, you know, a 30 minute abridged version of the play because they got to be back for chow or for count or whatever, you know. So that, there are those things internally, those hiccups that happen all the time. But at the same time, uh, I was able last year, about this time last year, I had a reporter from the South Bend Tribune and a videographer that were like, we really want to do a piece about your program. I, and I said, and I'm like, if you're coming, you're in the class. You know, I don't want you just sitting off to the side taking notes or whatever. So they came to my class for like three months and then wrote this beautiful, beautiful piece with, with a, like a seven minute video. Um, like months later, it took them about three months to put all this stuff together. That came out and the doors that opened to me at that prison, just because I'd gotten in good press. And uh, there had just been a, a, a huge expose about the, the private health care provider at the prison and people that were dying, you know, people that were, um, you know, almost dying from an abscess tooth because they weren't getting the right health care. And then suddenly here's this story that, that completely changed um, uh, the, the community's perception about what the, the prison was doing. And that really... I, I have no problem. I just walk in and out now, and people. <laughs> and so all the, the administrative side, they 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 celebrate the fact that I'm there, because um, I come in with an authentic heart, you know, no agenda. I understand that if anything has to shift in a day, it's going to be me, and I just get up against the wall and say, you know, go do what you got to do, um, and that adaptability I think buys me a lot of goodwill. I have a quick question for Alan. Mm -hmm. In the five years or so that you were involved in our program, uh, did you notice any change in the overall culture of the prison with the other inmates, with the officers? Um, I, th I think more with uh, uh, because of because my social group altered, so I noticed that more. Um, but I. I think um, some of the 
uh, uh, the recognition from from some of the the prison officials that um, you know that started to see that that the program was making positive changes in certain people, especially me. Um, uh, <laughs> that, so, <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, quick story regarding that. Um, uh, Captain Pedro is. Um, uh, a captain that had recently approved me to go back into the prison to see a recent production out there. Um, and uh, I knew him 15 years ago when I was a little jerkwad in, in the hole and calling him names and you know we had we had gone back and forth for, for years. And, um, and I think the transformation he saw in me uh, over that time over this time period, um, Kind of altered his perception of me and some peop other people that um, that I know were um, also had uh, were also going down a, a, a poor path. Um, <coughs> they got involved in this program and then they kind of started shifting their life around. And the officials seeing that, uh, you know, I think they give more uh, you know leeway to to the program. Um, I know this uh, our first our first production. Um, we didn't have a lot of props or clothing or anything like that. Uh, I think we had some doublets and then we had our prison jeans and whatever else on. And um, by the next time, uh, uh, I think there was a change in administration. Um, we didn't get to do a play the next year, but the following year we got to do one. And there was just, just I mean, we got full, you know, full attire, you know, uh, a lot more props were were approved, um, and then as the program continued, um, uh, what we're seeing now is they're now making props and stage stuff in the prison uh, for the for the productions, and they're allowing allowing more stuff in there. Um, so you, you know you can certainly see the, the shift in the administrations and in the guards' uh, perception of the program and what it's doing. What was it? I, I just want to follow up to what was it like? moving from one social set into another social set and not doing the things that you were doing before. Was there any resistance met with that? How did, how did you have the strength to make that move? Um, well, uh, I was switching from kind of, uh, uh, I, hang, I hung out with a lot of the gangs there. Um, and, and I think when I started pulling away from them, they started feeling like uh, a sense of like I betrayed them or something, mm -hmm. and and that which is common in, in the gang when a guy's getting out of out of that lifestyle, uh, all his buddies are like, like you know like where are you going? Like we we've been here, we've been you know we break bread together, we we hang out together, we talk, we you know, and and then now you're leaving. Why are you leaving us? You know, and then that betrayal translates uh, you know a, a lot of in a lot of times. Um, in, in violence or or negativity because that's what they know that's the lifestyle and so the trash talk and the you know mud slinging and, and stuff where you know oh that guy's a that guy's horrible he's a bad guy he's this he's that whatever um, and I just I just had to keep pulling away from it um, and it was it was difficult because uh, it sometimes brought violence to me from that uh, from that quarter. And uh, but I, I knew I, I still knew I had to had to trudge on and get away from that because that's all I was ever going to see if not. Um, so um, so the transition was was shaky for me because of what I had admired myself in before. Um, but getting you know once that transition was made and you know years pass and people forget things and you know people get moved around and things change um, you know they forget and then. You know, and then it's fine. It's smooth sailing from there. But how, how long did that process? Take? Um, about almost two years. Two years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was about a, a the last the <coughs> last time that they brought any kind of violence to me was about a year after I started pulling away from them. Um, and then over that period, there's just some some people talking smack and talking trash behind my back and stuff. And they they wouldn't say anything to my face anymore. And then. Uh, and then it just it just stopped all together. So yes. Well, I'm actually responding to something you said a little bit earlier before that question that was in here, and it was about how the prison and it's for everyone as well. 
So I just finished doing a show in the Indiana Women's Prison um, that was written by two incarcerated women. Um, and now it's actually starting to kind of move to the outside as well. So it's producing the inside and the really outside. But we um, found that at the same time that the administration at times um, were happy about what was happening and how the changes were being made, there were people in the prison who weren't necessarily happy about guards, mm -hmm. who in fact one of the women who wrote one of the pieces while we were in rehearsal, found herself in solitary for about three weeks. The empowering that doing this is giving some of the women who are participating in it, empowers them maybe to be a little bit more vocal, a little bit different than they've been. And in fact, there was some backlash related to words because I'm wondering if anybody else has experienced that and how to navigate that. Um, so. I don't get them in trouble. Is <laughs> actually right. Well, I didn't know. The whole idea of, idea of doing Shakespeare plays in prison is really, I mean, Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, that's not really prison culture. That's not for the inmates, for the guards, for the administration. It's not. It's way outside of their idea of what the place that they are. So, so naturally, a lot of people are going to have difficulty. Uh, with this thing that is so un-prison-like. Uh, but everybody has inside them something that wants more love. <laughs> is that word again? Uh, the, the officers, the, the in, all, the, all the people who are serving time, all those guys who are left back behind in the gang, they're waiting for their to come along with something or something. I think that um, uh, I, I know exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> I don't think it's a bad thing she spent three weeks in solitary. I don't think that's a bad thing. It's a sling and an arrow that we all must bear. And her ability then to reflect on why she spent three weeks in solitary is where her learning occurs. It's always about um, cautioning, where are you? The question is always, where are you and who are you with? And so confrontations happen all the time. Uh, she needs to figure out what it is that she did. And it may have been an injustice that was perpetrated upon her. It happens all the time. Injustice happens all the time. Horrible things have happened. I, I, don't, I don't get upset about them because there are moments that happen and it's understanding how it happened that keeps you away from the moment reoccurring. And that's life. That's life. So the, the sling and arrow that they have to deal with in prison is just a preparation for the big, bigger sling and arrow that they're going to hit when they hit the street. <laughs> it just gets big. So the reality is, is uh, Again, I'm there to fix me. I'm working on me. And that's how the circle functions. So she's working on her. You didn't get her in the trouble. You don't have that responsibility. That's not you. But you learned something from that. And now you question, was I responsible? How do I play? So that's your story, and you're moving along and gathering more experience and becoming a bigger human being, which makes you a better facilitator, which makes you a better artist. Mara, you were going to, you were going to add something to that. Oh, just that um, I think it's kind of what Johnny was saying about having love for for everyone, right? So the the staff. We sometimes initially have a reaction of like, can't they just give us the space to do our work? Can't they just participate? We want them to be in the circle with us, you know? And there's a lot of resistance to that because of their own stuff that they're working on. And their jobs are hard. So um, for me, it's about finding empathy for them and where they're at as well. 
and um, reminding myself that it's not it's not something that I may be able to fix, but the invitation is there for them to be seen as well. And we found that if we actually check in with them and give them permission to, to um, share with us what they're seeing and learning about the young people, then they feel like, oh, I'm being seen in her too, right? If we come in with our frustration front and center with the restrictions that get thrown at us and the behaviors that sometimes come out of nowhere that we don't anticipate, you know, from the staff or the administration. We have no idea about the layers of things that are happening when we're not there. We're there for a short amount of time. Um, and it's so complex. It's so complex. So for me, that um, level of compassion, I have to check myself over and over and over and just say, nope, it's the compassion for this whole community here. That's my concentration, too, is on the ensemble and there are individual obligations to the ensemble. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the students that I'm working with, um, this is the highlight of the week. I mean, I come in on Friday nights. I try to bring a Friday night experience. I'm not bringing beer in or anything like that. But I'm trying to bring a celebratory experience around, around Shakespeare, around theater. Um, and this becomes their, the highlight of their week a lot of times. They tell me that time and time again. And so they're very protective of, of the guys in the ensemble, and they live in a strict uh, program called PLUS, Purposeful Living United Through Service, which it's a merit-based program, but they're all at five years or less before re-entry. So they can be in the shower during count and get kicked out of that, that unit. You know, it's kind of draconian. So they look out for each other a little bit more. So, so that's... It, it, my biggest triumph in this work, I think, is their connection to one another, their reemergence of self um, over this process. You know, of um, because I teach in pretty much semester. That's kind of the structure that that was forced upon me. That this guy's going to help me actually erase. I hope. Um, but at the end of that six months, the communication, the openness, the authenticity that they have with the circle, with each other, with 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 Shakespeare, honestly. Um, is it's mind blowing. And so if, if you take the lesson of the ensemble, I think, into, into your circle, and what's our contract with one another, that might help people keep it in check when you know the, the other six and a half days that we're not in the facility, you know? Because there are times I come in and they're like, they're just down like this. We lost seven people off the unit this week, you know? <laughs> For no reason, they basically just cleaned house, and then I lost two of my guys that were right on the verge of, of just, you know, and I never see them again. Uh, but that's just part of the work. Want to go into the back? Uh, I'm I'm just so moved by this panel. I'm like tearing up. It's I I am appreciative of this work that you're doing because I know that many of those bodies that are incarcerated are black and brown. So thank you for that. Sorry, I feel really silly. Um, Oh, we'll all be joining you shortly. I was really uh, very interested in what, uh, Scott, you had to say because I work at Yale University and I've been given the opportunity to expand what Yale Repertory Theater is doing um, as far as community engagement. And this work has definitely been missing from my practice as an artist and an activist. I think I'm afraid of it, quite frankly. Um, the idea of going into a prison building, frankly, scares the shit out of me. Um, and so I'm just wondering, as you kind of made the transition into this work, what were some of the first steps you took toward it? What were some of the fears you had? Were there any misconceptions you had about it that were kind of you know, shattered um, as you start to really get into the work. Are there any reasons why someone should not do this work? I mean, you said that we yeah. need more people participating, but what are the what are the signs maybe that you see in your organization, the resources that you have that you would suggest, like maybe not this particular uh, work? So, the first thing I did is I I talked to some really smart people who had been, you know, developed the network. And uh, 
That's one of the reasons the Shakespeare in Prisons conference happened, because prison arts practitioners didn't have a place to come together. We were all kind of siloed and mm -hmm. doing the same thing in a million different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step. Come join that circle. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, it, there was a there's a there was a certain commitment, there was a certain calling within that that, that I knew um, that if I was going to be part of this solution, I was going way outside my comfort zone. This was my own special gift that I could give to the world. And it was scary as hell. It really was. And I started by, first off, finding, my, finding a network, finding those who could help me put puzzle pieces together in the beginning. And then, from that, starting to bring performances and, and ad hoc workshops as and where they were available with some of the, the companies that I manage and making this a priority and going back to my school and saying, this is what we did with these resources. Was this a bad thing? And people like, couldn't say no. And then I started to develop my own program week by week by week. But it was getting to know the apparatus of that correctional facility. Um, because if I had just said, like, I mean, here's the other thing, like, there's so much religion going on in my facility, and it's not, it's not good religion. It's, it's fundamentalists rubbing people's noses in it. And I come in and I'm just like, no, it's changes in you. You know, let's, I'm not gonna bring God into this equation. Um, so I found my own unique way to, to, to present my works that would empower the guys and not make them feel like they're judged victimized uh, as they constantly were um, and then I just constantly refine you know I step back after every class and I'm like what did I do right what did I do wrong so that self-reflection is really essential part of this and am I okay am I not okay and I see people that go in and start programs that they get too close and that's dangerous there has to be a professional boundary you can love these guys there's compassion for these girls these women uh, but you have to find a place that keeps the program safe. Mm -hmm. I think the, the uh, there are as many models of this work as there are individuals doing this work. The reason that we created the Shakespeare Prison Network is to be a resource to each other, but I think more important, it is to do conferences like this to say, uh, we're here to help you. Uh, because the work is so big, it's endless. There's a place for everybody. And, and that's, if you're called to do this work, I feel, I can feel your heart. <laughs> yeah. Amen. To that. And <coughs> there are those that have gone before you who will give you anything you want everything. The generosity is enormous. And you will find your way in. And when you find your way in, you will then be doing the authentic work that you are called to do and who you are and how you want to do that. There is no one way to do that. But there are a lot of people that have a lot of experience with dealing with correction. Problems I've had in 22 years have never been with the prisoners. They've always been with the administration, always. So if you don't take the administration into account, if you're not dealing with the administration on a daily basis, in the same way that you're working with those prisoners, you're gonna get, you're gone. And there's always a way to find your, I just, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> endless optimism. My guys get so angry and the women, the Jews think I'm pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here. That's why That's why we did this panel. This panel is to come and say, for the tw there's got to be 25 people here at TCG that want to know about this work and who are also doing this work. And that's how we teach each other. That's what we're about, is to say there's a resource. If you're called, we can help. And 1-800. I just want to say a quick thing about
about demystifying too, because um, I feel like society has put a label on prison and in removing those bodies from our society and putting them in a place that's locked, right? And I, I hear you on the fear part of it, and I think any human being has that because we've been conditioned to have that. And at the same time, we're talking about human beings. <coughs> These are human beings, and we all, every one of us, have to make choices every day that are good or bad or neutral or whatever, right? And so I think in the end, for me, it's around um, demystifying and thinking that it is a, a, a place, it's certainly special work. I don't mean to say that what we do is not ultra important, but we're, we're working with human beings, and I think that's where the heart center needs to run me. Um, I may have been lucky because my dad was a, um, was a prison chaplain, so I had a little bit of insight <laughs> ahead of time. Um, but yeah, just, just that human to human thing that I think that Kurt is eloquently, as usual, talking about is what's supposed to be. I, I want to say something quick to that also, if I could. Um, like, I didn't know when I, be, before I began, like, what I was getting in for. And the big surprise is, I keep saying this word, I'm sorry, apologies, is love. And like, bam, you know, I go to prison and I don't, I'm, that, I'm, that's the least afraid I am <laughs> in that week is, is when I'm in there, you know. And, and uh, Alan and I, a week ago today, mm -hmm. were uh, at Two Rivers watching The Tempest together. <laughs> and after the play's over, the room just explodes with laughter and the tears and hugs and love. So much love, it knocks you down. It's so beautiful. And I didn't know that that would happen, but I thought, let's put on a play. And, uh, and I don't know if that would be other people's experience or what the, like Kurt's saying, all the programs are different. I don't know what other people will find. But uh, one thing that, that you might find is, 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 some, is, is like some giant, Love blast that you didn't know was coming. And to sorry to speak to that point, <laughs> um, when, uh, I think it's important also to remember uh, for anyone uh, thinking about volunteering or going into a prison uh, that has some of those fears is uh, to remember that you're bringing um, uh, acceptance and compassion into a place where it's completely void of that. <laughs> and when you bring that in, you'll get it back a hundredfold. <laughs> That's, do you still have a question? So you can Me? Yes. Well, I was um, touched by what this woman from Nepal said about the transformation, the, the power um, of this work to transform um, people inwardly. And I mean, that's what you were speaking to. That's why that woman found herself in isolation for three weeks. She discovered something. In, inside of herself, and that's what this work does. Um, and and so I was curious about how much check-in is done, and and because um, I think that's what need, sounds like that's what needs to happen um, to to um, keep up with the transformation that's happening with people. Um, but I was at that performance that that Johnny and Alan. Uh, we're just describing, and and it was my first time in a prison. I I was ter I was scared <laughs> to go, um, and and so I'm coming at this from a very different perspective. I um, it was something very new to me, having done um, been an artistic director of the theater that was playwright centric. So this was this is still very new to me, um, and. Walking out of that performance, it was the Tempest, and I was struck by how disorienting um, it is being inside because of the fluorescent lighting. And I looked at the clock on my way out, and it was nine o'clock at night, and it could have been noon. It's like the Las Vegas experience. You, know, you just have no sense of time. And we walked out of that building into the most 
glorious sunset I had seen in decades. There had been a tempest. There was lightning in the sky. There had been thunder and rain. And <laughs> I was just really knocked out by the irony of that experience. And my first thought was, those men have no idea what was happening outside. They won't because there, there's no windows. However, <laughs> it all happened in here and in here. And so I've just, I've just been really thinking about that a lot. Um, the power of, of the imagination so and what this work does. I would posit that that sunset wasn't trying to be a sunset, it just was. <laughs> and that it was you who saw the sunset in a different way mm -hmm. because you had been transformed. You recognized mm -hmm. the beauty of it because of the experience that you had. But that sunset, this is beautiful as every sunset that's ever existed. It's just in how you look at it. How do you see the world? And that's that's you. We're working on. And you being able to tell that story, we find ourselves in your story. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happens. I'm always constantly aware when I step through that sally port, the difference in the pressure in the air. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's impossible, mm -hmm. but there's such a, it smells different. Mm -hmm. It's brighter. You know, and all you've done is gone through one little gate, you know, uh, but it is, it's something that you, you, it, it, it makes you grateful for, for the freedom that you have and, and I'm really conscious of it because a lot of us, I think, take it for granted, just our ability to move through this world. Yes, sir. I just have a, a data, back to the data question you took reference, we talked about this yesterday, but, you know, they want data mm -hmm. so that we can get in the door. I'm moved by testimony relationships and, and those that convinces me but that's not what they want is there a network yet in place where we can somehow fund participate gather commission access it for one another and I'm not even sure how much it plays nationally because uh, I know in our in Minneapolis some 10,000 things there Hennepin County Ramsey County they don't care about each other they, they, you know we can tell Ramsey County this is going great over here and Hennepin County goes so what I don't so, in terms of data, how vocal does that data have to be in order to be relevant to them? Do they look at something that I, I have no idea? And I'm, I'm the music director, I'm not an administration guy, and I have no interest in less ability. <coughs> but I'm gathering that. I, they wanted me to, to, you know, to really talk Very to folks. quick for everybody in the room California got their arts and prison program reinstated <coughs> with money from the legislature. How could they possibly do that? They must have put together a very convincing case <coughs> check with, with, the, with their, what their data is, is probably the strongest yeah. in so, this country. So one of the goals of the Shakespeare Prisons Network was to connect with academics and with researchers that, that would be interested in long-term studies. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of at a nation stage right now, but that's definitely one of the things that all of us as an international cohort have, have been clamoring for, our long-term statistics about recidivism, this or that, or statewide statistics, um, because, because funding is a problem. Um, we're not necessarily in Indiana gonna find funding through our state arts council. But a private foundation that it speaks to to some some goal that they have um, of engagement in the community. If I if I had a two pager that I could just slip <coughs> to them, that might be the difference between a, a nay and an, or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's going to fund the program for five years. Yeah, we're finding it more a barrier with the institution mm -hmm. than with the funding. Uh, it's the, the change in leadership, uh, and they are answering to someone else perhaps and asking for proof. We need, we're now linking all of our activities to recidivism, show me. And you can tell me, and that's true, and that's actually the best data, but that's not what they're yeah. looking for. And so I think that what you have to do is find the question behind the question. Tell me what you want. It's yeah. listening deeply into that. Tell me yeah. what you want. What kind of data do you want? And ask, asking the next question. Because it's only through question that you lead someone to their own epiphany. It's always through questioning. Like, 
and knowing who you're talking to. When I talk to legislators, I use one statistic. Over a 22-year period, with almost 100 prisoners on the street, we have a 6.1% recidivism rate, and it's accurate. We don't lie like government does. Because in the state of Kentucky, if you've been out for two years, you commit a crime, and come back to prison, you're convicted, and come back to prison, it's not recidivism, it's a new crime. If you're in Michigan, it's three years. They, they do smoke and mirrors. I just tell the truth, which means if a guy's been out for 20 years, commits a crime, is convicted, and comes back, I'm gonna count it, because it's just easier to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking to legislators, it's 6.1. We track that ourselves. If I'm talking to a, a warden, if I'm talking to a captain, they don't give a shit about pardon the French recidivism rate, because that's their job. They want to keep their job. What they do care about is violence on the yard. So I only give them one statistic. In the prison where I have worked, after two years of working there, we reduced 50 to 60 violent acts per month to below double digits. That's what they care about. You went below double digits. Because they want a safe place. Officers want a safe place. Prisoners want a safe place. So it's knowing what it is that they want and asking a question that's behind the question that'll get you there. And I don't provide the answer easily. And I don't leap to the answer until I hear recidivism for legislators and violence for officers on the yard. <clears throat> and, and it's and it's all it's an ever-changing environment and isn't that beautiful because that's what life is the guys that are men and women that are coming out of prison man they're going to figure out who they are when they come out of prison because of the stuff that comes out of and how difficult it is to, to, to be on the street that's what we have to prepare ourselves for surviving on the street. And so asking the guys, what do you need? What tools do you need? That's the way my circles function, our circles function. It's all about, what's the question? Somebody have a question? Yeah, we have, we have a pedagogy. Our success is based on a mountain of failures. Everything that I know has been based on failure. Because then I have to figure out why I fail and how I can not fail again but knowing I'm going to fail again. So that's for me is success. Is my success for me is what's my next failure. Yes, I'm gonna, you know, and so my my question would be, 
that like how yeah how to navigate how can you advise me help me to navigate those barriers and especially the ones that I'm more concerned about are the body language the barrier things so what because working with actors is a lot of like yes get together hold your hands lie on the floor which I know that for inmates you cannot ask them to be lying on the floor because if they're women they can remind them from you know oppressions and, and things that so all that rules that I kind of starting to know because I'm talking with people that touch there but I still don't know them very well so I I, I, I want to have all the freedom that I can to be with them but at the same time I know that there's like a lot of things that I have to be careful uh, and yeah so I would like some advice from <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good luck. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I just. You just have to start, you know? And I'd say, uh, for, for me, um, and I'm sure we can all talk about this if Kirk can even remember from the very beginning of his tenure in this work, but um, it's going to change so much, right? And I think. It's about saying yes to them rather than expecting them to say yes to you, right? So as a director, as a theater professional, assuming that you have anything to offer, these people who are trying to figure out how to survive is a little ridiculous. So if we can flip it around and think like, I have just a toolkit here that if I offer in this space, decide together what, I mean, Kurt talks about the circle, I'm sure that you could get more specific and say, what does that circle mean? And what's your circle gonna look like? What are the um, agreements that you can make with this group together so everyone's invested? And then know when you need to say yes to them. So just a quick example, um, and a colleague of mine was running a residency at a girls' facility, and um, there was a young woman who was completely shut down. She hated the whole experience. She kept coming, so that was something. Mm -hmm. But she hated the whole experience. They were working on a King Lear project, and um, they were writing, and we took the script that they were writing and mashed it up into a King Lear slash um, devised piece with their own words. And um, she wrote in her journal, she wrote, um, fuck King Lear, I fucking hate Shakespeare, um, I fucking hate this, <laughs> fuck you, fuck you. And my colleague was like, you know what? I think we should put that at the end of the piece. <laughs> 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 what do you think about that? And she was like, what? You know, like <laughs> totally taken off guard because someone had taken what she um, was trying to do, do to really just express herself, I think. Um, but in, in, in that setting, in, other, um, in another context, would have been disciplined. And we were like, yeah, right on. I get you. I hear you. Like, let's, let's use that, right? And so it was so amazing sitting in the audience and watching their performance, which was super strong and super incredible. And then at the end, to have um, she didn't read, read her, her own writing. Someone else wrote it, read it for her. But to, like, with full conviction, stand up at the end and say, <laughs> Fuck this! I fucking hate Shakespeare. <laughs> Fuck Shakespeare! <laughs> it was incredible. It was like the room was just. It, we were crying. We were laughing. I mean, it was it was amazing. And so I think to me that is the that is it right there. Is like how do I say yes um, and recognize that resistance just wants to be heard in the same way that mm -hmm. everything else does. To do a, to to maybe assist. <clears throat> journey, um, ask not what you can do for the circle, ask what the circle can do for you. You are totally prepared, you've got an arsenal of stuff, so you wait until it's called upon. You just go in as a human being with an open heart and offer non-judgment and unconditional love, like Johnny says. And that's how it all begins. Because that's all we want. So I'm not there to teach them anything. I'm there to listen. I'm there to say to myself, what can this circle teach me? And every circle is there. <coughs> so you, you're, you're ready. You just go in and be a human being. And find that right moment for that spark. An idea will come. But the number one thing is, 
to be a human being and they'll flock to you like moths. That's what they want. Yeah, wield that authority wisely mm -hmm. because it's thrust in their face every moment. Mm -hmm. And so when you come in and, and mm -hmm. as opposed to boarding above these guys and you come in and you say, let's hold hands. Like, what? <laughs> And then the next time you come in, you say, let's hold hands. Now we're going to close our eyes. And then the next time you come in, you're like, all right, let's, let's do some breathing. Let's do, let's do, you know, sun salutation. Let's touch our toes. These things that, that are, that are so incredibly, um, laden with vulnerability and, and, and the guys will be so resistant to it at first, but you just, you take it at the pace of the circle. You know, and you put your agenda aside, and you have a you have a knowledge base, you have a knowledge bank. Don't don't think that at the end of the first time you go in, there, there's going to be this big glossy production. There may not be, but that doesn't mean you didn't succeed. That doesn't mean that you haven't changed lives with what you've done. You know, just getting people to connect through the five feet of concrete that they have built around themselves over one, two, five, twenty. 30 years to get them to, to reach out and to touch, to, to lift an energy ball off the ground as a group. That is a huge success. Sarah, so we have one time for one last question. I saw you got your hand up. Thank you. I'm going to stand up so you can see. Thank you for sharing all your experiences. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a, a what if it's not Shakespeare question. Uh, I Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> Heresy. I work in communities telling their own stories, but I've never worked in an incarceration setting, and I think um, we'll be doing that in the future. So I know that we won't be doing Shakespeare, um, I think. And uh, I'm curious, maybe for Mara and Alan, um, and, and for everyone, it, would the reception in the um, powers that be be different if you went in and said, we're going to be working with folks telling their own stories versus we're doing Shakespeare, because Shakespeare always has that like automatic, this is real art seal of approval. Um, and you, you've spoken about working um, interweaving you know, personal stories um, into the Shakespeare work. And if there's a, you know, a different experience, it's, I think everyone, it sounds like in your work, people are expressing their own stories. It's just what the final outcome may be. Um, and then for Alan specifically, you know, as someone who participated in this program, would you have been more or less interested if you had heard, you know, this is a theater workshop versus you'll be doing Shakespeare versus you'll be telling your own story as a kind of entry point? Okay. Um, uh, well, I think um, uh, I was looking for something, uh, uh, something positive. Um, like I mentioned earlier, when you, you know, when you enter into that space uh, with acceptance and compassion, then you receive that back. And I, and I think that's what I was looking for, um, that, that was lacking in my life. And, and I think whatever the outlet is, whether it's sharing our stories, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's some other whatever, um, is going to be beneficial. So uh, whatever the platform is, I think just just approaching it with that with that acceptance and compassion and, and, and letting them into that um, will we'll be successful no matter what. So. Hey, I'm, I'm grappling with how to respond because I feel like well, first of all, there's just a thing around um, confidentiality and safety. So I don't know how it differs in adult facilities because I don't work in them. But for young people, um, we actually are not. We're not allowed to identify anyone that we're working with, period. And then there is a lot more um, oversight when we're drifting into the territory of getting at their own stories. I think in terms of buy-in, not from the participants, but from the staff and administration, there is something safer about Shakespeare. Um, although I think that can apply to any text at all. And we haven't just done Shakespeare. We did um, one time Jesus Taught the A-Train. We used text from that, scenes from that. Um, as I mentioned, we're exploring uh, more historical stuff. So I think the text can be generated. For me, it's <coughs> just being really clear with those that you're working with where the levels of safety are. So both on the participant level and then on the administrative level. 
um, some people wanted to share their stories and some people just don't. And I think I wouldn't want to be in a situation where I'm forcing anything. One thing that we do is we have them write, but then we also give them permission to determine what to share. So we go through a process where they're helping us call and they tell each other. They say, that needs to be in our script, right? Um, you need to make sure that that's in our script. And then we give them the, the choice of whether or not they want to read their own story or not. Yeah. We never tell the audience what is who and who is what. Right. So they are hearing snippets, but um, not their own. So I think you have to, first of all, figure out like what are the rules in the particular um, facility or the population that you're working with. And then it, I think it matters where the story is told. Um, we did one time have a young person who was working with us in community in our out of school programs. We were doing um, a mashup on love in general and using different Shakespeare plays as a platform. And um, one of the prompts that we were asking was, what, what would you do for love? And her crime was, um, sorry, um, her crime was that she had actually uh, killed someone out of love, who was a kind of passion. Um, and she decided to tell that story, and she wrote the story, and we, um, she decided she didn't want to be in it. But her younger cousin was in the program with her at the time, in this um, after-school program with her, and her cousin played her. Um, and there was something for her that was, I think, given the platform of love, that um, allowed her to take that step, and we talked about it for a long time, the staff, like, is this okay? Mm -hmm. You know, we had to check with DYS, like, is this okay that we're doing this and keep them very much in the loop? Um, and it ended up being an incredible experience for everyone and she was cool with it. But she had reached a point where she was ready to do that and we were the container that could hold that for her. Um, but that, I feel like, was a very unusual special thing and she had been working with us for a number of years. So. I don't know if that gives you enough of a, a response, but. And just caution, caution you to think about it as being therapy. Oh yeah, I mean, this, I have worked with a lot of populations that, but and these kind of best practices and ethics around telling your own story, just not in the incarceration setting. So, yeah. I mean, those those questions, I, you know, I work with all the time in terms of surviving sexual abuse and other things. I was just curious in terms of the, in the incarceration setting with the officials, you know, is it, are you more or less likely to get permission to do the program from the institutions? Um, and that question of like Shakespeare being considered real art versus, you know, just telling your own story. Just go and say you want to teach that kind of class. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be done. People do device theater. They do, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we work, uh, we work with uh, Playwright, well, Playwrights Projects works in the same facility that we work in. And they go in and they teach playwriting courses and, and do and do and then they have people act those out. So that's a form of devised work right there. So it, it I wish that we had a couple of people that did not do Shakespeare work, but they canceled out last minute. So I'm sorry, but they would have they would be able to talk to you and help you navigate that as well. Um, Thank you. Did did we have a sign in sheet? Uh, no, I took it as a name for people who didn't scan in, but if, if we can, I'd like to see if people if people would, are interested, please sign up. Uh, Kurt has something. Do you have something? Some paper over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. We're gonna be we're gonna have a a, a, a conference next year on practitioners in uh, San Diego. So if if you all want to be involved in that and and find out more information. Uh, sign up and we'll be getting you out some information around that. You know, it'll be next next uh, March, March 23rd. Go ahead. And that's for, um, not because it's called the Shakespeare in Prison Conference, but to be clear, it's for all types of prison practitioners. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If anybody wants to see Minneapolis in December, we're not having a conference, but 10,000 Banks <laughs> is doing a gathering and just trying to gather some folks. Delaware folks have been starting to do these things just so we can sit in the same room for a few days and eat and drink and share stories, this kind of stuff. You know, because there's still so much, there's so much overlap. And instead, everybody's doing, and you have, you are doing your own thing, your own version. But there's so much to be gained, you know. From, and we don't go in and create; we just want to perform. But there's still so much yeah. that I'm hearing that is making so much sense and going, duh, 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 duh. Um, which is just.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.